I think we can start now. So, hello everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the first edition of the webinar series on uh, high weather impacts. It's a collaborative project between the Angular Earth System Scientists and the World Meteorological Organization, uh, the World Weather Research Program, the High Impact Weather Project. So, um, happy to give you the floor, Marion, to introduce uh, the webinar series, and then I will move to uh, the introduction of the Code of Conduct and give brief introduction of YES community for people who are interested in knowing more about us and uh, maybe joining us. And then we will have the awesome webinar with Professor David. So, Marion, I give you the floor. Thank you. So yeah, as Fatin said, this is a great partner partnership between High Weather and the YES community. So High Weather is a 10-year project uh, by the WMO World Weather Research Program. When we're looking into an advancing um, our pr uh, provisions for improving forecast warnings and high impact weather events. And part of that is really understanding, observing and observing the phenomenon. And we're very interested in what citizens can contribute to this research. And with partnership with YES, we've come up with this great idea to share um, some experiences from our great speakers about um, high impact weather events and citizen science and follow us on Twitter or check us out on our website. And um, thanks again for YES community for um, partnering with us for this webinar series. Thank you very much, Marion. So before moving to the awesome talk, um, I would go quickly through the code of conduct. So here you can see um, a couple of requests we share with you. So, uh, but we, uh, we would like to inform you that the recording will be available just after the webinar and also an outcome report will be elaborated and shared after the webinar series. So please have your time just to read this. Uh, please for the questions, uh, you, can, you can see that you are all muted. So please drop your questions in the chat box and then we will share them with Professor David uh, Schultz and uh, we look forward to the fruitful discussion that we're going to have in a few minutes after, after this. Um, and just before uh, moving to uh, the webinar with uh, Professor David, I would like to go quickly through the introduction of the Young Earth System Scientist. Um, yeah, we had the chance to introduce this last time, but uh, for people who could not join us last time, I'm happy to share with you this brief introduction. Young Earth System Scientist is a network of early career scientists uh, from Earth science disciplines. Uh, we are uh, representing the whole world, so we have uh, 1,800 members representing 110 countries. Um, we have several working groups. So we have the science working groups, the outreach working group, um, the online working group who is hosting and helping with this webinar city and the membership. So if you want to have more uh, information or if you have questions or if you want to contact us, you have all, um, you have the address, uh, the email address there. So you can just uh, drop your questions and, uh, and send emails to, uh, to ask about uh, more details and we will be happy to, to interact with you. And also you can contact us on Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to, to your interactions and to your emails. And now I'm happy to, to give the floor to Marion to introduce Professor David Schultz from the University of Manchester, UK. Okay, cool. So I'm stopping sharing and giving um, some chance for um, Professor David to share his screen. And as he does that, I'll just introduce, um, introduce him. So Professor David Schultz is a professor of synoptic meteorology at the University of Manchester and director of the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation. Among his many research interests are the physical processes that lead to hazardous weather events such as heavy rain, tornadoes, snowstorms, and windstorms. He has published over 170 peer-reviewed articles and since 2008 has served as the chief editor of Monthly Weather Review, the oldest continuously running meteorological journal in the world. He is the fellow of the American Meteorological Society, senior fellow at the UK Higher Education Academy, 
winner of multiple teaching awards. He is also the author of Eloquent Science, a practical guide to becoming a better writer, speaker, and atmospheric scientist. So we are very excited to have you here tonight. And uh, thank you for agreeing to um, speak and talk about this very interest and interesting topic. So I'll give you the floor, Professor Great. David. Well, thank you so much and uh, appreciate this opportunity. So thanks to Marion and Fatin for inviting me in the whole YES community. So this is a project uh, to understand how weather affects pain. And the motivation for this work comes from the um, evidence that three quarters of people who suffer with chronic pain believe that their daily pain fluctuates with the weather. And so they may experience a flare up of their pain maybe once every week or, or every two weeks. And this is not a new idea. This idea that the weather affects people's uh, well being goes back to Hippocrates, uh, 300 BC, who felt, uh, who, who believed that uh, where people lived and the direction of the wind affected people's health. So, a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of people believe this, but when you look at the scientific literature, on this topic, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, lack of consensus and um, not a lot of support for these claims. And so one of the things that that we did was we did a review, and this was led by uh, Anna, our PhD student, of uh, this project. And uh, what we did was look at a large number of studies. In this case, 43 different studies, and um, Two thirds of them found at least one self-reported relationship between some kind of weather variable like temperature or pressure and um, pain. Now, of course, you have to worry about a positive publication bias that if uh, someone did a study and didn't find any relationship that maybe they wouldn't have published it. But even more important, when you go into these studies that claim uh, that there's this relationship, they'll, they will even admit that the relationship was not clinically significant or that um, the relationship made a minimal contribution to pain. So again, the, there's a lot of contradictory results out there. Some people found that um, cold weather uh, was associated with more pain in the people in their study and others found that warm weather produced, uh, was associated with, with higher pain. If we look at one variable in particular, barometric pressure, uh, there were 38 different studies that looked at barometric pressure out of the 43 in our study. 20 of them reported no link between the pressure and pain, so nearly half. 25%, um, 11, reported high or increasing pressure was associated with higher pain, and seven reported low or decreasing pressure was associated with higher pain. So total lack of, of consensus here on what's going on. Now, why is this the case? Why can't science, why has science not to date been able to give us a definitive answer on this relationship between weather and pain? Well, when you look at this graph that Anna produced, you see pretty remarkably that you could have a large number of people in your study but not necessarily get them over a large number of days. And so um, given the fact that people's um, pain flares up once every week or, or two weeks or so, you can see that most of the studies are, are less than 30 or 40 days long. So you're not gonna sample many pain events in that study. On the other hand, um, you know, there were some studies that went quite long, you know, over a, a year or so, but again, they only had 100 or so people involved in these studies. So there, these studies suffered from um, either small sample size of, of individuals or um, not long enough. And um, one of the problems with um, not extending the study over a long enough period of time is you may not be experiencing a wide range of weather conditions. Certainly if your study only lasts 30 days, 
well, you're only sampling the weather over a course of a month, not necessarily over, you know, the full range of seasons that someone might um, experience. And as I mentioned, some of these studies had as few as nine observation points per patient. So whether you would have captured a pain event or not in this period um, with so few samples is, is questionable. Of course, another issue is that the weather is a rather subtle influence on people's pain. It's certainly not what we expect to be the dominant effect, mood, the amount of physical activity that people experience, whether they take their medication. These are all factors that probably have a, have a greater influence on weather. And so what we're trying to do is tease out a very subtle re relationship. Um, so a large data set over a long period of time with um, a large number of people involved will be needed to get at the answer to this question. Another issue is, of course, the weather data may not have been coincident with where the patient was. In fact, some of these studies were of people who were hospital bound, um, so they would never have been exposed to the external elements. Of course, you know, the pressure inside a building changes um, relatively consistently with the pressure outside the building. So, so that effect may have been measured, but certainly temperature, wind speed, precipitation would not have been experienced by these people if they never left the building. And then finally, we had to worry about um, the selective reporting of statistical tests. In some of these studies, they had um, tens or, or hundreds of statistical tests that they were performing. And so you had to wonder whether, um, you know, just the sheer number of tests would have produced false positives anyway, as well as the fact that you may have had a po positive publication bias, as I mentioned before. Now, ultimately, what we're after is this physical link between weather and pain. And, and people may ask, well, why is that? Well, if we understand the kinds of effects, um, external effects that make people feel more pain, then we can produce um, maybe future interventions or therapies that may control for those influences. And even if we can't develop a way to control their influences, we can certainly give people um, more information about how they might want to manage their pain. So, so for instance, people who are in chronic pain and know that the weather is going to lead to a downturn in, in, their, um, in their health and, and an increase in pain over the next few days may choose to um, you know, not do gardening or other kinds of um, activities in order to better manage their pain. Or um, you know, for people who may be in such pain that they can't go to work, can better schedule their working environment um, you know, days in advance if they know they're going to go through a painful um, study, a uh, painful period. So, so enter uh, Will Dixon. He's a professor um, at Manchester. Um, he's a professor of digital epidemiology, but he also wears the other hat of a uh, clinical rheumatologist. And so he sees patients, he hears these anecdotal studies, and he also knows from his own research that he can, um, that, that maybe this tool of mobile health um, and, and recording people's symptoms and, and using smartphones or watches um, to capture people's uh, health and their symptoms may lead to some insight in this problem. So he built a team at University of Manchester and I'm the token meteorologist involved. And the idea was to build an app that would, um, that would allow um, patients to self-report the severity of their symptoms with the GPS chip inside the phone you'd be able to geolocate uh, where the person was reporting their uh, symptoms and then tie that to the closest um, weather station in the UK. And so the goal then was to build the largest uh, in terms of number of people involved and also the longest data collection effort to look at this. So in 2005, Will got um, money from the Medical Research Council in the UK to do a pilot study. And he worked with a patient group uh, to co-design the app. Um, and 
worked with these people to figure out what would motivate them to enter their data on a regular basis and, and what were the things that would inhibit them from entering data on a regular basis. And then we ran the pilot study for two months. Now this is what the app, uh, one of the screens on the app looks like. It was built by U Motif and uh, Motif represents these little petals of, of the flower and the patient um, can, can drag um, this flower either outward or inward radially um, to set their level of pain or fatigue or tiredness on waking. You can see all the 10 different elements that we um, collect information on on the right here. And each one of these can be set from levels from one to, to up to five for most severe pain, for instance. And so we can collect all this information. And in this way, we can control for things that um, were unable to be controlled in previous studies like mood and physical activity. We could actually control for that and factor that out if we had a large enough sample size. So for the pilot study, he recruited 20 patients. Six patients um, eventually dropped out for various reasons. And um, so we got five entries per week, 65% of the time um, during this pilot study, which we thought was pretty good. Now, um, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, found out about Will's study and uh, they were running a TV show called Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And uh, so they came to interview Will and talk to people who were participating in the study. Now, the producers of the show wanted to um, kind of give the audience, the TV audience, uh, kind of a take home message or something that they could do themselves um, as a result of, of this TV segment. And so Will goes, well, this is a perfect opportunity to take this pilot study and go national with it, with the help and the support of, of the BBC. Now, the problem is, of course, that they wanted to um, run the TV show in just a matter of a few months, and we had um, no money to, to, to go uh, nationwide with this. We had, um, you know, so there were a lot of barriers. And, and, you know, if you're trying to do a clinical study, you know, there's a lot of steps that you need to do in order to collect data on, on a large cohort like this. So fortunately, um, versus arthritis, which is formerly Arthritis Research UK, um, they were open to the idea of taking a, a very special request at, at short time scales, um, and they gave us uh, enough money to to go national with this. And and so you know they're the primary supporter, and, and they've been a great um, great supporter and and promoter of, of this work and, and getting the word out. So so then we could um, build our social media. Presence. We got a web page. We got a Twitter account, and you know we started to set up um, the study to start collecting um, to get people to sign up and start collecting the data. And so um, by the time the the TV show aired, again the BBC really um, stepped up and, and gave us a lot of support. Um, you know, with a link to uh, our website on uh, from the BBC website. Um, Will got invited to the BBC breakfast show several days after the TV program aired and was able to talk up the study. So how did, how did recruitment to the study look like? Um, so you can see we launched the study in uh, late January 2016 and um, after the Trust Me I'm a Doctor show aired, it kind of crept up to about 2,000 participants who had downloaded the app, but then when he went on the breakfast show, things just took off. Um, you motif recorded that there was one sign up per second uh, during the time of, of this show, which was pretty incredible and they'd never seen anything like this in their experience. By the time recruitment ended, we had 13,000 people who had downloaded the app and 10,000 of them um, provided at least one pain report. So um, as Will says, you know, we were thinking we'd be lucky if we got a thousand people 
to participate in the study. And in fact, we had 10,000 people who we were able to use the data with. And it wasn't just the TV show, you know, we had people in the study themselves were, were some of the best recruitment tools that we had. Um, you know, here's a, a person, I passed the details of the study on to several members of our community garden, gardening club, and we're all part of the study and it's a talking point. So, you know, word of mouth, as well as the BBC, BBC show and uh, Arthritis UK and our ability to connect with patient support groups around the UK that allowed this um, study to just really take off and, and give us way more data than we would have anticipated. Now, I wanna say something about the retention and the engagement of our study because it, it was off the charts. If you look at most apps, you'll see that only about a quarter of people who open an app um, or 25% or of people who download an app will open it after they use it for the first time. And, you know, I mean, I can raise my hand there and say, you know, I download a lot of apps and rarely ever use them, um, you know, after, after I open them for the first time or so. But, you know, even, even after that, even after three days, um, you know, only 20% of users are retained. And after three months, only 4% of users of most apps are retained. But when you compare that to what we did at Cloudy with a Chance of Pain, 80% um, of our users, that's the 10,000 divided by the 13,000, entered data, you know, downloaded the app and then entered the data at least once. Within a week after install, we still had over 50% of people who were still participating in the study. And even after 200 days, so nearly seven months, 11 people, 11% 11 were still entering data nearly every day. And our study lasted for um, 15 months, so 450 days. So this was really incredible engagement. And um, what do we hold that down to? Well, we sent out a daily prompt to people who had downloaded the app uh, every day at 6.24 p.m. We thought that was a good time to hit people up and ask them, remind them to enter their pain reports before they went to bed. We sent out a weekly newsletter to subscribers. We had the online community, as I mentioned before. We had a blog that um, was updating people and in interviewing people, including members of the team, and you know, giving, us, giving them weather education and pain education, linking them to resources and so forth. We also had a public engagement um, push to. We were appearing at science festivals and um, street communities and, and so forth. And we even gave the participants um, the ability to analyze not only their own data on their own phone, but um, the group data on the web. And you can see some of these graphics that they were able to do in real time um, from uh, data on the web from the whole community. And you know, these are some of the anecdotes that we got from the people who were participating. You know, I'm obsessed with these graphs about, you know, looking at, at their own um, data and, and trying to contribute ideas. And, and we had a place on, on the website where, where people could look at the data and then see relationships and, and send them in to us and, and speculate about what they think was going on in the early stages of the data analysis. And, um, you know, another person is a serial research participant. This was my favorite study so far. It's creative and, and relevant. And, and I think, again, the bottom line really for the engagement is that this was a problem that, that obviously people knew about. Three quarters of the people, you know, felt that the weather influenced their pain. They, they had a sense that, um, you know, scientific community wasn't um, all on board with this. And even some of their doctors, you know, they would go to their doctors and relate, you know, that felt that their pain was influenced by the weather and the doctors would dismiss them and say, there's no evidence for this. So again, I think the question and, and the importance and really made this an exceptional uh, opportunity and it's demonstrated, you know, for citizen science. Okay, so you may be wondering, tell us about the results. You know, it's, it's nice that, you had this big data set, let's, let's find out what you did with it. So um, we got several papers out of it. There are two primary ones that really looked at 
the data and this weather pane relationship in detail. So this is the first one. It appeared in Digital Medicine, a Nature publication. And it used the um, approach, uh, epidemiological approach called case crossover design. And what this does is it compares an event day, so a day that someone um, experiences pain, to an, a non-event day um, where they don't experience a pain flare on, um, within the same month within an individual. So there's no issue about if someone is reporting a pain level of four or five, whether this relates to someone else who may have a different threshold for their pain um, and you know, may, may report something lower. So this was a strength of the case crossover design. And we had the developer of the case crossover design on the author list, Malcolm McClure. He was involved in the design of this approach. Now, a pain event, as we defined it in this study, was um, a two or more category increase. Remember, the pain level goes from one to five um, from the preceding day. So again, relating to the fact that most people think their pain fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis, we can look at this increase, a two-category two increase in pain levels. And when you crunch through the 10,000 people who participated in the study, um, and applied, you know, eligibility criteria for, you know, is there enough data to do a case crossover analysis on this particular person? We had 2,600 people um, who were eligible and ended up um, contributing data into this analysis. And we used multivariate um, regression to, to look at this. And so here are the four primary variables that we looked at, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and pressure. And you can see that um, higher relative humidity led to um, an odds ratio greater than one, indicating that um, this was a higher than normal um, amount of uh, significance to, to people's pain. Same thing with, with the wind speed. At higher wind speeds, you tended to see odds ratios for people uh, higher than, than one, and also are uh, for pressure, lower pressure was consistent with that. So, so this was kind of the epidemiological approach to analyzing the data. And being the meteorologist on the team, I wanted to take a meteorological approach to this. So I used the tool of um, synoptic compositing, where we looked at the bottom and the top 10% of days where the most or the least um, participants were experiencing a pain event. Uh, on that particular day. So a different approach. It didn't require us to filter the participants down very much. So all 10,000 people could still participate in this analysis. And uh, for this analysis, we define the pain event as a one or more category increase. We redid the analysis with a two or more category increase and it didn't change the results. So that was relatively um, it, was, it was not significant um, to how we define the pain event, as well as a number of other different thresholds that we describe in the paper. So what do the results look like for that? Here you can see, again, we get similar results that um, in this case, we see a higher temperature was uh, an effect, uh, as was um, higher dew point um, for lower pain. That was not seen in the previous study, but the other categories with lower pressure leading to lower pain and higher wind speeds leading to lower pain were also um, was, was supported by the previous study, the statistical study as well. Um, and relative humidity was not um, statistically significant difference um, in this study. So subtle differences, but but again, the the pressure, the wind speed um, were consistent. Um, across these two different studies. And when we look at weather maps, and, and these are the first ever weather maps that have been created um, in one of these weather pain studies, you can see that um, at 500 millibars in uh, the color here is a high, uh, is a, sorry, a, a low uh, height anomaly at 500 millibars indicating a trough uh, over the UK at the time of a pain event. Whereas 
at 500 millibars during um, periods where not a lot of people were reporting pain events. There was a big ridge at 500 millibars over the UK, again, bringing good weather, light winds, so forth. And then when we look at the sea level pressure anomalies, that's all consistent with that. So lower pressure centered over the UK for um, high pain events and low pain, uh, I'm sorry, low pain days um, with a, a high pressure and a cyclone over the UK. So that was all really good. We we're excited about the consistency in um, some of the variables and the, and the patterns between these two different studies. In terms of public engagement, we had a, the university issued a press release. The Washington Post was writing an article um, about weather and pain. And so they contacted us and, and we became kind of the focal point of the story, which we were really proud of. And then the Weather Channel brought us on board um, on their Weather Geeks podcast to talk about the study as well. And so because we already had um, the epidemiological study um, and a big press release back in November, and this was happening um, in middle of this year, um, we didn't really want to go to the press with the, with the same messages. And so what we wanted to do with this time was say, you know, look, this is really the largest study to date. And this would give us greater confidence in the results over any of the other previous studies. And, and so what we were trying to do was kind of get out ahead of um, the message here where people go, didn't you just report this stuff earlier? And, um, you know, try to give a, a different message. And also we wanted to say that this confirms the anecdotal evidence and, you know, allows people who suffer with pain, you know, not to get so bogged down, um, you know, in, in um, you know, to, to give them confidence that this, there's really some scientific evidence for this. And you can see, this is just a sampling of some Twitter uh, comments that we got. There's always a few people dumping on us, you know, new research results, everyone already knew this. And even the Capital Weather Gang is like, hey, you know, just read the story and shut up. Um, you know, then there were other people, there were a lot of people that had a lot of nice comments. It's really nice to see this confirmed. Um, you know, it's been my experience. And of course I had to um, go on there too. And, and again, even though the, this is what the story and the press release, you know, and our message and the podcast was, kept trying to get that message out here. You know, look, this is the biggest study, you know, this isn't, you know, we're confirming anecdotal evidence, sure, but, you know, I think we're actually coming up with the strongest evidence to date that this can be really important. So what's next for the Cloudy with a Chance of Pain team? We really want to get at what's the weather variable responsible for pain. We got some idea about the overall patterns, you know, I mean, the fact that there's low pressure there and temperature and, and winds and um, humidity are all going to be influenced by that. But we really want to get at um, what the weather variable is, because that's going to be the key to translating this to, um, you know, making people's lives better with treatments or so forth. Another thing that we're working on is I have an undergraduate student doing um, his dissertation on the difference between people who stayed indoors and the people who stayed outdoors. Again, this was one of the benefits of our study because we were able to ask, we were able to ask each participant each day, how much time did you spend outside? And so we can now segregate the population into people who stayed inside all the time and people who were outside a lot of the time. And as I alluded to previously, where we're really after is pain forecasting. You know, can we get to the point where we can give people, um, you know, knowing their personal history, knowing their susceptibility to the weather pain relationship, can we give them a tool that they will be able to say, you know, in a day or two or three days ahead, you know, what is their pain level going to be? So to summarize uh, our talk today, the fact that we were able to collect data over a long time on a large population was necessary if we really wanted to tease out the subtle relationships in this age old question of what's the relationship between weather and pain and get beyond just the anecdotal evidence that, you know, a lot of people seem to believe. And, you know, as Will, uh, you know, expertise is smartphones and engaged citizen scientists were what really allowed us to answer this question 
on scales that we, we were previously unable to do. Uh, our result that higher pain days are colder with lower dew points, lower pressure and higher winds um, you know, seems, to, seems to hold true and the opposite for days where people tend to not experience uh, a lot of painful events. Now our study gives confidence to people who believe that weather influences their pain, even when their own doctors don't believe it. And kind of another uh, lesson I'm, I'm sorry to say is that even you know, when we get out there and we try to, to go out there with our message that you know, this is the biggest study, this is the most confidence that we have, and you know, this can really um, you know, shore up people's confidence um, you know, who suffer from this. We still, people were still missing the point on social media. Um, you know, maybe that's the problem with, with trying to go with a sound bite that you know, low pressure and high winds and, and you know, lower temperature produces, you know, is associated with more pain. I don't know. But anyway, um, again, thanks, thanks again. I hope uh, you found that useful and um, happy to turn it back over to Marion and Fatin. Thank you, David. That was a really interesting um, presentation. And um, yeah, definitely for me, a few questions have popped up. So I'm just going to remind um, the audience that you can put in your questions, your comments in the chat box or the Q&A and just um, uh, put in those questions. And I think we can, we've already seen some pe people asking mm -hmm. some questions there, but I'll give some people some more time and I'll um, being a, a host, I'll give my question first. <laughs> um, but yeah, so really interesting. And th I think from the citizen science perspective, what I learned from this is really the engagement. You really engage with your audience. And maybe, um, is this something that you planned beforehand and kind of had like a communication plan? And do you have some tips for our audience in terms of if they're doing citizen science projects, any tips on how to go about engagement with their participants? Yeah, we. Um, one of the reasons that we needed funding was that we needed someone to manage the project and, um, you know, the engagement part of it was certainly a big part of, of her role. Um, building the newsletter, you know, managing questions from people coming in, you know, it was nearly a full-time job for her while the project was running. And so, you know, I mean, I think that was really the key. Um, again, I, I've, being a meteorologist, I've not really been involved in, in these kinds of studies before, mostly just stick, you know, to model data and observations and, you know, gridded data sets. So, so this kind of public engagement, um, you know, citizen science was, was new to me. And so it was interesting to see how well that worked. And I'll have to say, you know, Will and the rest of the team were already really good at this and experienced with it from their previous studies. Um, that they've, they've worked with, but you know, I mean, they've never worked with anything on this kind of scale before. So um, I guess if I were to say, you know, what were the kind of tips for other people that want to, to do this kind of project that, that leads to success, um, you know, for, <laughs> first get on the BBC TV show. That's, that's obviously, uh, you know, I don't know how to coach you to, to do that, but that, that was obviously a big plus for us. But even if that had not happened, you know, finding the local communities, the patient support groups, you know, and getting Arthritis UK, uh, Arthritis Research UK, you know, now uh, versus arthritis on board um, early on, even if they had not provided funding, getting them on board as a, as a sponsor, as an advocate for us was really important. Um, you know, and again, as I mentioned, I think the question that we had was really important and engaging for people and and it was very personal to them and so you could see the dedication of these people you know we got emails from people you know i was answering questions from um our participants about the weather and and how they might have um you know experienced it and you know so so for me you know someone who's not traditionally involved in in health research totally eye-opening to to see how this works. So, you know, a, a community um, engagement, social media manager was, was essential because us scientists and students and that, you know, we're, we're all too busy to, to 
do it right and 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 manage it. I, I can see that we would have really dropped the ball if it had been left on our plates. Thanks. Thanks for that, David. Thank you very much, David, for the Brian talk. You know, when I was preparing the event communications, as I'm coming from energy background, so stays inside something very exciting for me and really new, you know. So I was like super curious to know how is the link between weather and people experience with pain. And today, um, yeah, during this awesome uh, talk, I got some of the answers to my questions. So it was super interesting for me. So uh, now let's move to have the questions. We have, I think, three or four questions in the chat box. Uh, we start with Anna question. Anna is asking what, uh, what we see in, on the background of Professor okay. Schultz. So she's asking about the background picture. <laughs> yeah, that's just a picture from uh, the International Space Station where I'm broadcasting from. <laughs> so it's, it's some kind of convective storm and uh, you can see the anvil flattening out there. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool. And she's also asking a second question. And this one is about the choice between public engagement and media engagement. She said that I can see that it has advantages, but also on the other hand, it can also take a lot of time uh, for those poor e comments. What is your what what's your take? Should everyone do it? Should you do it sometimes? for the sexy research or worthwhile experience for early career scientists? Um, well, there's a lot of things there. Um, I guess, like I mentioned, having, having someone who managed the project and, and you know, was the head of social media engagement and public engagement was, was a big help for us. She managed all the incoming emails, you know, when, when we had a press release, you know, she shepherded it through the process. You know, of course we were participating and various members of the group, you know, some were, were more social media savvy like myself. And, you know, I was happy to get out there and um, talk to people um, and answer their questions. And, and uh, you know, Will and, and other people um, were very interested in this. And Anna, um, our PhD student, helped uh, record some videos that ended up um, highlighting people and um, their struggles with pain. But you know, there were other members of the study who, who just weren't into it. And I don't even know if they even have a Twitter account, but um, you know, and, and that was just the distribution of people on the team and what they were doing. And so, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they were contributing less. It's just, you know, I mean, to me, it was it was interesting and something I enjoyed and you know it to the extent that it went with you know the other social media stuff that I do on my regular day job you know I mean that's that's fine so um, again I think I think as long as there's at least someone or a small group of people on your team who are into this you know not only the social media bit but you know engaging with the media getting on TV getting stories in newspapers, on websites, on blogs, then, you know, you have a better chance of making connections with your target audience. And, and we've seen that too in other meteorological studies. You know, you may be familiar with the um, weather data rescue project in the UK. And, um, you know, they went live right at the time of lockdown. So all the time, um, you know, the people were sitting at home with nothing to do. Um, you know, they could be inspired to, to go and digitize, help digitize old weather records, um, you know, from mountain weather stations in the UK and, and help bring, you know, that, that data set to, to, to life in a, in a digital form. Thank you very much, David. We have also a third question is coming from Claudia. Claudia, she said, hi. I would like to thank the speaker and for this great talk and ask, uh, are he or his team thinking of extending this research beyond the UK? And thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. We've, we've had some um, feelers out with, with other groups and, and so forth. Um, 
because I think that's that's absolutely essential. I would imagine that we would see similar results in the mid latitudes, you know, any other mid latitude location if we were to do this in Canada or the US or you know maybe continental Europe. I'd be more more curious to see what people, you know, who live in the Mediterranean region think about this and and what weather influences they might experience because um, you know when we we're in the, when we are in the mid latitudes you know, people often say, you know, we'll go, go to the tropics, um, you know, because you'll find uh, relief from your pain there. And, you know, that, that's just not only modern times, but even, you know, hundreds of years ago, people were saying, you know, go, go to the tropics, you'll feel better. And you can imagine that if um, it's the pressure pattern that is responsible, the pressure pattern is gonna be less variable from day to day in the tropics. So, um, so we can see that, but certainly I would imagine the people in, in France and, and Southern Spain probably still feel pain from time to time. It, it would be useful to, to find out what the weather patterns that look like um, when they experience pain flares. I'd definitely be keen to know that. I, I originally came from the tropics, so I think I would say that I, I have the same thinking, go to the tropics, less pain, just kidding. But yeah, it would be good to see that data um, if, if that's possible. So just following up from Claudia, so she asked whether um, it's uh, extending, extending it beyond the UK, but she also asked in the Q&A, is there a plan to continue engaging? Because you've already engaged with a huge amount of people. Is there a plan to continue engaging with this citizen scientist community? Yeah, that's one interesting thing. And, and I remember when we ended the study, I think we were all a little bit sad that we had built up, you know, this huge community of thousands of, of people who are entering data for us. And, you know, we decided to, to shut the study down. Well, I, I should say we, we, we stopped official data collection with U-Motif. U-Motif um, still allowed people, you know, we still have the apps on the phone and people can still track their, their daily symptoms and um, you know, have all the functionality that, that they had during the study with the app on their phone. But, um, you know, that data is not being collected. Uh, well, maybe if, if you motif is collecting it, you know, we're not getting it for, for analysis. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was always one of the things. I mean, certainly we've continued to engage the newsletter when we have press releases on our new results or updates. But, um, again, because of the, the funny nature of funding, you know, Arthritis UK gave us money to do the study, but not analyze the data. So, you know, then we had to go out and find money to, to analyze the data, you know, and then we had, you know, the benefits of, of students and visitors come on board that, that were able to. And I think, you know, there were other pots of money where they, Will was able to squirrel away people, you know, for a few days a week to contribute to the data analysis efforts. And, you know, well, you know, I, I wasn't yeah. funded at all to do, you know, lead the study that, that I did, but, you know, that was just something I wanted to do because I had the time and, and um, you know, the interest and the, and the skill to, to do the synoptic compositing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. And I guess as the citizen science projects, funding is always a key, tricky issue. But I think what's beautiful with your project is that you had this like really good kind of data and then you had uh, collected over, um, you showed that graph, like a lot of people participated and it was over a long period of time and you really made something out of that. And that was pretty cool. So yes, um, um, the- You have to I hand it the, to the participants there. I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't just come down to us. You know, we had to identify or, you know, the, the right people, the coolest people had to sign up and, and be engaged and continue to enter their data day after day, which, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, the daily diary, uh, you know, it's just yeah. not that, that interests me. So, you know, I really hand it to these people, you know, and, and if there's any of them watching out there, thanks for, um, you know, doing that. We couldn't have done it without you. And I, and I really seriously mean that. I mean, I, I am blown away every time I think about, um, the, the level of engagement and, and you know it's an order two ma orders of magnitude greater than you typically get from citizen science experiments yeah. like this. I think that's that's quite amazing that, that volume of people and their participation 
And I think, um, yeah, like uh, Yulia Polkova is asking a question about, and he's, she's also really enjoyed your presentation, um, that is there any indication of a seasonal cycle in the pain data since you gathered it over, over a year? Yeah, if you go to the bulletin of the AMS article that um, where we did the meteorological analysis, there is a seasonal cycle. The problem is we only had 15 months of data. And so we only went through one seasonal, you know, one and a third seasonal cycles. The, the question that concerns a lot of members of the team is that the nature of the people who were in the study was changing. So when we launched in January, there were a lot of people who entered data, um, you know, in, in January, February, March, we had we had very high turnout. But as um, the the study progressed and we entered the second year, we we now had kind of the you know rather than just the people who were in for a few days or weeks, we now had the you know people who were in for the long haul. And so there's the question of whether um, the population of people who were present in January 2016 is the same population that was present in January 2017. That's, that's an issue and it concerns me. And um, so there is a seasonal cycle, but I would caution that um, that's, that may be highly tempered, if not entirely controlled by the nature of the people who are involved in the study and, and their habits of engagement with the study and, and maybe even their levels of um, how sensitive they were to pain. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we have um, a question from um, Beth um, as saying that multidisciplinary studies like this can be tremendously rewarding and lead to new insights that are not possible without experts coming from different areas. Do you have any tips for people wanting to engage across disciplines? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it's, and it, you know, is, in my role um, in the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation, that's exactly what we're trying to do is build an interdisciplinary network across the university of people interested in studying natural hazards and their impacts on society. So, so in our case, um, you know, I have to hand it again to, to Will, um, how I got involved in this study, how he found out, I guess, that there are even meteorologists on campus um, was, was that he was at a, a, a meeting uh, on campus and, and he met, um, you know, the head of our research group <laughs> and uh, said, oh, you know, do you do meteorology? And he says, oh, I don't, but, you know, member of, you know, our group does. And, and so that's how I, I got the connection. And, you know, it was really, it meant a lot to me personally because I, I like interdisciplinary research in general, but also because most, most, both of my parents suffer from arthritis and I guess there's the possibility that I've inherited it, you know, and will experience it later in life as well. So it, it kind of takes on a little bit of a personal question, personal importance to me. Now, how do you, how do you get out there and do this? You know, you, you just have to be open. You have to be persistent. You'll find a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, that's a really cool idea, but then you know, won't sign up or, or won't commit to anything. And that's just the nature of, of people in, in science and academia. We've just got so much stuff going on. You can't sign up for everything that everyone invites you to. So you really have to find those, those people who are dedicated, um, you know, or interested, you know, that work well together on a team. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if you find the magic formula for how to do that, please email it to me. I would love to know. But but yeah, in, in this case, it, it was, you know, I mean, I, I can't say about how, you know, the, the, the team of psychologists and statisticians and epidemiologists and clinicians that that Will brought on board. I, I, I don't know. They were already on board when I came on board. So I don't know how he grew them. But, um, you know, I, I certainly know from from similar efforts to to do things that it, it's not easy and, and you have to be persistent. And it, it, it often comes down to, to luck and, you know, serendipity 
to make the right connections with the right people that you enjoy working with and broaden your team. Yeah, you have a note to your congratulations. Um, here, another question is coming from Sofia. Sofia said, maybe you don't know the answer, but I was wondering why the study picked 6.24 p.m. to remind users to the app. Was this based on other study indicating that the better time is between 6.30 and 6? A very interesting and useful study, by the way. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. No, so that's much. a good question. I, I, I wasn't involved in that decision directly, but I, I kind of remember some discussions about why that time was, was chosen um, after the fact. Certainly, you wouldn't want to pick something at the top or the bottom of the hour. You know, if people are, you know, getting ready to, to sit down to watch TV or something at, you know, and the TV starts, show starts at the top or bottom of the hour, um, you know, you're not going to catch them. You know, that, that message will, will come at a bad time. So 624, I guess, you know, if, if people were watching TV or something, then, you know, maybe, maybe now they're watching the credits of the show at, that started at six o'clock. Um, and so it was a good time. I think, you know, certainly you wouldn't necessarily want to go too much later than that. You know, after nine o'clock, people are already winding down, you know, may have turned off their phone for, for the evening, um, you know, may, may not even have the phone on them. So I think there was a balance between not hitting them up during the day when obviously they were engaged with, you know, whatever their day-to-day -day business was, certainly not during rush hour when they're picking up their kids from school or coming home um, and, you know, not making it too late at night. So it's either annoying or they've already shut off their phone for, for the day. And, you know, again, not picking times at the top or bottom of the hour where, where they might be starting some kind of new task, like new, new TV show or something. Cool. Um, thanks. Um, I, I, that was on top of my head as well, that question, 624, very, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, just one more question and we'll definitely wrap up. So just um, right on time, I guess. Um, so um, um, Agnes from, uh, was asking, only multi-skeletal pain was reported or also headache? Because she says, um, I always experience headache with low pressure. Right. So the nature of um, who we invited to the study was it was wide open to anyone with chronic pain. And when they downloaded the app and, and filled out their demographic information, we asked them, you know, what kind of pain, you know, diagnosis they had had. Now, because of the networks of people that, um, you know, we had built and, and were advertising, Musculoskeletal pain was certainly the, the dominant um, diagnosis that, that people were, were given us, but, but we did have people who reported uh, migraines and um, you know, other more kinds of widespread body pain and headaches. But um, you know, just, just the nature of the people that responded to our survey, again, we didn't limit it, but um, you, you can see if, if you go to the, the first study in digital medicine, um, the supplemental information shows that um, the percentage of people who participated in the study and, and uh, you know, declared their diagnosis with, you know, headaches or, you know, other kinds of migraines was was relatively small. So so we didn't have a large data set. You could certainly replicate the study, you know, and engage all the patient groups and support groups, you know, around migraines and, and so forth, because I think it's it's the same kind of anecdotal evidence. A lot of people report headaches and, and pain um, associated with fluctuations in the weather. And although we haven't looked at the data specifically around that, um, the pre by data, I mean the previous studies on that to, to see, you know, if they suffer from the same kinds of biases that musculoskeletal pain studies do. Um, I imagine a, a smartly designed study like Cloudy that targeted people with headaches and migraines would, um, would, would be a useful thing to do. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, thanks so much, David, for um, answering all of these questions that the audience were asking us. And thank you, everyone, for posting these questions. Very interesting and very engaging. 
and um, just really appreciate the talk that you gave. And it's for me, it's looking at a successful citizen science project showing us something um, that can be scientific or something quite anecdotal that we might already know, but actually finding the data and the analysis and showing really robust science from data coming from citizens. It's, a, it's just a wonderful thing to see for me. So thanks for that. And thank you um, to our um, audience for asking all these questions. And I'll turn it over to Fatin to uh, conclude this session. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you very much, Professor David, for the brand talk. I really enjoyed listening to you and also to see all this fruitful interaction and discussion of the topic. Uh, thank you so everyone for joining today. Thank you for the organizing team for the great work you are doing. And please don't miss to join us for the next webinar with Dr. Richard Tibanes from the University of Philippines. We'll communicate all details about the webinar on YES website and also on our social media. And uh, thank you so much. See you next time and have a great evening, day, afternoon, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.